I want to know since we are all Buddha nature and we're all created from the same substance and essentially we're all one. My question is, so where does the individual come in? My own individual personality, everyone's own personality. Where exactly does this come into the notion of we're all basically one? Last time you really needed it was at the passport control at the airport. That's, That's when your individuality is really important. Security check, seat reservation, etc. Not enough. <laughs> is that enough? Yeah, individuality is important. But if we remain only with the individual, we become tremendously limited. What is awesome in human history that we are capable of so much as an individual, yet we can see how limited we are together. Without our own decision, nothing gets done. But if we only decide things for ourselves, we become isolated super fast. So the individual is important as a building block of something bigger, like a relationship, an interpersonal relationship, where you experience that the individuals, too, are melting in the fire of love. And where's your individuality in those blessed moments of only two becoming one? These are the blessed moments of a relationship. Where is your individuality at that time? It's gone. If both individuals are gone, then you're both lucky. Then comes family. So the individuality of the family is suddenly the couple becomes family because there's a kid popping out. Okay? Then there's stark realizations. One, there's this baby that you made. With the help of the other, of course. But your part, your DNA, your love, your action, in there. What do you do? And then suddenly the pattern shifts. and You realize this little being is more important than me. That's the natural ego killing in, a, in an everyday life setting. And of course, later the father's I, my, me, the mother's I, my, me, it gets stronger. But just husband and wife disappear, become mother and father. The transition is tremendous. It's huge. You can see how the content of the individual changes, but our true nature, that doesn't change. Only, only our karma does. And then, and only then, can you see that the individual is not only impermanent, it's made up of the five skandhas, as we chant in the Heart Sutra, form, that's body, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness. In Korean, it's the O-on, the five skandhas. The skanda is best translated as the building block of the individual. If you have no body, if you have no mind, if you have no feelings, if you have no etc., you don't exist. Like if the house has no roof, no windows, no walls, it doesn't exist. But originally, the individual is not an absolute and fixed entity. Every part of it is changeable. Nothing is immutable or absolute. That's the Buddha's great teaching. That there is no absolute I. Okay? We are made of parts. And the individuals make higher entities, more complex units. So if you see yourself in your right place as an individual, you can be useful. You can help. Also, you can receive help. There's interaction between you and the environment, including other humans and other beings. If not, we become a tremendous burden to each other and to this planet. Korea, and I mean South Korea, has 105,000 square kilometers. 50 million inhabitants. It's the third or fourth most densely populated country on Earth. Hungary has 93,000 square kilometers with 9.7 million inhabitants, 20%, give or take. I always tell people, if you have a problem with uh, traffic jams, human interaction, efficiency, etc., go to Korea. Five times the pressure. So if they didn't have the Confucianist, Buddhist, Taoist, and later on uh, Christian faith, 
something that structures the society and uh, conduits its functions and powers, what would that have been? How could they have coped with each other? You go to Korea, there's no place where you cannot hear some traffic sound. Should that be an aircraft, some kind of motorized vehicle, or a boat? You cannot walk on the mountain more than like a few hours without meeting a bunch of people. It's impossible to leave just one township or a village without seeing another one right on the horizon. So dense. Yet, due to its culture, the individuals are arranged and organized in such a way that they can cooperate. And this very high-class cooperation made South Korea into the country that it is today. So it's the quality of our interaction as individuals that make us into a group, a community, a society or a civilization. So what kind of mind do we have as individuals? That's what defines our quality of life. So you work on the minds individually and in a group then we can improve. If not, things only get worse. So the individual is not the problem. Neither it is the solution. But we as individuals must bear the responsibility of being who we are. Then comes our great effort in our practice. Okay? Um, you mentioned before about the chakras and that we stop at the Manipura chakra, in the middle chakra and not bring it up. So I'm wondering, I know in yoga, in Tantra tradition, the idea is in fact to bring the energy from the bottom all the way up to the highest chakra and thus attaining some form of enlightenment and becoming one with everything. So my question is, why does Zen stop in the middle? Because it has Taoism as one of its founding elements. So Buddhism and Taoism together makes Zen. And... Uh, Taoists, they focus on the Tantian and the Indian, Tibetan, Nepalese culture. They follow a lot of the traditional yoga elements where you had to open your crown chakra and have some strong out of body experience and then come back. Experience shows that if you stay in your Tantian, your mind can become clear, undivided without any special experience. You don't have to go anywhere. You just have to be here and now. What we must understand about the Indian style, that it's a Guru Vada, which means your path is dependent on the teacher for decades. If you don't have a teacher, usually they actually move into the same ashram, sometimes the same house, if it's a married lineage, okay? so. In the ashram, 24-7, you have someone to guide you. And this kind of sequential rise up to the crown chakra and then above is not without danger. So people can really lose it. If they don't follow precisely the instructions by the guru tailor-made to them, very dangerous. And Intentionally, I do not name traditions. I just named the culture. I do not want to do any disservice to any living tradition. But with Taoism, with the Tantian focus, of course you can have Dharma accidents, but far less. Because this is really focusing on the undifferentiated state of mind and actually the energy center of the body itself. So look at the kids. If you want to find their center of gravity and lift them correctly, you use the belly, not any of the limbs. They are so frail. The limbs are very soft. So if you want to lift them, actually, you just use it here, the belly, and they're very happy because they understand. You know how to handle them. So this is the point where your mind is one. You don't have to go outside for that. Then inside, outside become one spontaneously without the mind losing the moment. Okay? And then comes the most important part. If it's an experience that comes and goes, it's not what we are looking for. 
It's okay to have any kind of experience, but don't attach to that. Because what does not come and does not go, that's what we are looking for. And that's what is looking. That's why these special experiences are not necessary, or if they are there, they are just byproducts, but not destinations. Okay? This last summer I was in Thailand, in one of the monasteries over there, and um, it was interesting to find out that the monks over there eat meat. They, yeah, they, they do. They only get food that is given and been cooked for them. They don't care to cook themselves, but that Theravada monks in general eat meat, and I was also told that Mahayana monks in general. Some. Some eat meat. All. The Dalai Lama, I was told, eat meat, for example. And the, the Buddha himself also, like the Theravada tradition, also ate meat. Um, so my question is, how come here in Zen in general and in the monastery we have a vegetarian diet? And do you recommend also to maybe continue this vegetarian diet outside of the temple? Vegetarian diet is better for the environment, better for human beings, body and mind. In the old tradition, they accepted offerings and the rule was that the animal shouldn't have been killed for you, or the monk. But this was easily bypassed, that, you know, my little cousin has a birthday, so the whole cow is <coughs> slaughtered, and then the whole monastery got meat and 10% remained in the house. They wanted to make merit. So you should understand, in the old days, in India and in all the Theravada countries, including later Mahayana countries like Nepal and Tibet, there was no other real source of protein. They had to accept it. There was no vegetarian diet and supermarkets loaded with meat substitutes. They had to eat, they had to sustain themselves. When you read the Buddha's biography, some biographies say that when he was like 84, 85, he got a kind of a mushroom dish and the mushroom was almost poisonous. No, it was meat. The meat was uh, turning his whole, the, the bowels upside down, and he actually died with a, with a problem of digestion. The digestive tracts got clogged and he died. It's clear that in the old days they had no choice. Now we have a choice. In the Buddha's time, there were about 150, 170 million people on the entire planet, less than West Coast. It was, it was very different. Now, with the current state of uh, humanity, 50% of all greenhouse gases come indirectly and directly from animal grazing and animal production. Very, very big problem. So times have changed. We have meat substitutes. We have a very, very developed diet. We have 10,000 cookbooks that actually give you full sustenance without eating meat, even if you have zero blood type with enzymes hungry for meat. The times have changed. Also, the karma of killing animals is no more negligible, no longer. We kill thousands and million times more animals than 2,000, 2,500 years ago. We cannot ignore that. So, it's a, it's a big problem. So, it's not just ahimsa, the great principle of non-harming. It's, it, it's okay. It's great. But it's our vital interest to consume as little meat on this planet as possible and reduce the bondage and suffering of animals. And I'm not just talking about the changes it brings about in your own body and mind. It's what we do to the planet by uh, grazing hundreds of millions of livestock and chicken and uh, eating millions of tons of fish. Times have changed. We have to change too. How come Japanese Zen monks marry? I don't know any other monks who get married, but Japanese Zen monks do. Actually, not all Japanese monks marry. Most of them do. It's due to Emperor Meiji in 1876. If you watch The Last Samurai with Thomas Cruz, okay, then uh, you can see how the Meiji Restoration begins. So Meiji first wanted to westernize Japan 100%. And Katsumoto, his teacher, actually rebelled against him to remind him what is Japan and what Japanese values are. And he was killed in the process. So when Katsumoto really wanted to keep his identity against his own emperor, because he submitted himself, but he also served Japan. That's the tragedy in the movie. That's why it's such a good movie, actually. 
Then in 1876, when the movie ends, then the Meiji Restoration begins. And that's when they started to evict and clean out all non-Japanese religions. That's why there is no Christianity whatsoever in Japan. Done. Until the end of the Second World War, there was nothing. But Buddhism had been there for centuries. Yet, notably, it came from China and Korea. Okay? So it was not indigenous Japanese. Shinto was the original Japanese. And when it got mixed with the Tibetan Tantra, then it became Shingon. Shingon was the kind of multiple polytheistic deity practice. Uh, very similar to Tibetan, actually. When Meiji had to decide what to do with Buddhism, it had already been there for a thousand years plus. So what do you do with something which is not Japanese, but became completely part of Japanese culture? Unalienable part, for that matter. So he said, okay, but then Buddhism has to serve the emperor. Then it becomes really Japanese. So then the monk said, so what do we do, sir? He said, you put the imperial tablet, the face of the emperor, at the level of the Buddha. Then you treat the Buddha's word as if it was the emperor's word. And you treat the emperor's word as the Buddha's word. Imagine that. Next, he gave concessions to the monks. They can eat meat. They can drink alcohol. They can marry, have their families in the temple, and then you have hereditary succession versus chosen succession, that your sons become the new abbot or abbots. That was the imperial gift to Japanese Buddhism. That's why they live like that until the present day. Why were they willing to like give up on so many Buddhist ideas? Give up? What are you talking about? It was a matter of life or death. And they took it. Because if the emperor offers you something and you don't take it, it's an offense. So the emperor said, you guys go get married and do this, this, this. So they did it. Because the emperor said so. And by the way, a generation later, when it was the Manchurian War between Russia and Japan, monks went to the battlefield. And they, they died with Namu Amita Butsu on their lips. It went that bad that they could identify the Kshatriya behavior, the Samurai behavior, with the enlightened imperatives of the Buddha. So it took less than a generation for the spiritual imperatives of Buddhism to be totally integrated into what they called later Imperial Buddhism in Japan. And that's why the Second World War happened for Japan in the way it did, including the colonial period, the 40, 50 years before the Second World War. There was no spiritual guidance that could have stopped Japan from doing what it was doing. And the reason was in the Meiji Restoration, mainly. I don't go further back in history. But it's very, very dangerous when all the checks and balances are taken out. There's no spiritual guidance, no kind of control. And then the emperor can just do whatever they want. And that's what happened. So I want to thank you all for being here, practicing together. And uh, I wish to encourage all of us to meet from time to time again, practice the Dharma, and uh, walk on the path to enlightenment and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.